Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, the early birds who are here today uh, are in anticipation of the opening of the uh, Emerging Technologies Conference a little bit later today. But we thought it would be a fantastic opportunity while we have so many uh, visitors in town to spend a little bit of time talking about one of the um, mega projects that we've got underway here uh, at the University of Saskatchewan and several other universities across Canada on digital and computational agriculture. Um, we're also fortunate uh, today to have uh, a group of uh, agritech experts that have come from the UK and are meeting with uh, Canadian researchers and companies um, to figure out ways in which we might be able to work together. So we will incorporate uh, this morning, uh, after the coffee break, a, a, a roundtable discussion with some of the UK companies that will uh, uh, also present uh, ideas and uh, technologies that they've been developing. Um, just a couple of housekeeping announcements, and I'll probably have to repeat this when we open the conference properly, but just to say, you've probably seen all the um, the hardware uh, with cameras and uh, microphones and, uh, and, and uh, uh, various other pieces of equipment around. We are live streaming pretty much everything we do at the conference. Um, we're also taping stuff so that we will have podcasts for people to download later on. Um, we found at the, the previous conference that that was actually very popular. We had a couple of thousand like additional people camera. to the conference uh, attendees that uh, avail themselves of that. So we're, we're doing that again at this uh, conference. Um, if anybody is uh, concerned or wants to have a discussion, Arj, who is over in the control room, are you over there, Arj? Uh, will uh, explain in a bit more detail what actually we're capturing. Um, and I just want to say as well, we've, we've had a lot of support from sponsors uh, both for this pre-session and for the, uh, the uh, conference itself. Just want to acknowledge this morning uh, Genome Prairie that have supported us um, and uh, they've supported the registration desk, so you should have seen some signs there as you uh, registered. And also the, uh, the College of Agriculture and Bio Resources here at the University yeah, I've got on the camera. Uh, this uh, uh, mini symposium. Uh, concerning computational and digital agriculture. So what we're hoping to do this morning is just give uh, people a, a bit of a feel for the kind of research that's going on in what we now call PERC. We always have uh, strange acronyms in Canada. It, you can't really get a grant unless you've got a good acronym for your, for your, uh, your proposal. PERC stands for Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Centre. Uh, it's a virtual center, so there isn't actually a geographical center for it, um, but it is a collaboration of roughly about 114 researchers now across our campus and about six other universities apart from uh, the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, in order to uh, start this out, I, uh, I thought it might be a good idea if I were just to show you a few slides which describe um, the intent of this and a little bit of preliminary um, uh, data just to get a sense of the, the kind of data we are gathering and analyzing. Um, but then we'll have a series of uh, speakers that will come in and talk in more detail about specific as aspects of it. So um, the, the, uh, the fund that we were able to uh, avail ourselves with yeah, is a federal fund. To, uh, called a Canada First Research Excellence Fund Award, and it was for uh, quite a large amount of money, $37 million, uh, over a period of seven years. So the idea was to put together uh, a multidisciplinary program um, in which we would be able to link yeah, plant phenotypes to genotypes. Um, obviously, that is something of a holy grail for um, uh, plant breeders, and uh, plant breeders do this uh, by observation and intuition. The question has always been whether you could uh, digitize any aspects of that and uh, um, develop what we think of as digitizing the redesign. Um, as you'll see as we begin to develop this idea, it goes beyond simply replicating some of the things that a plant breeder would be able to see and do. Uh, because we should be able to extend the observations using different types 
of, uh, uh, of uh, image acquisition. So uh, is this going to work for me? Oh, there we go. So our motivation for doing this, um, and really the motivation for this entire conference, is the observation that we, in the next 50 years, will have to grow about as much food <clears throat> as we have ever done cumulatively since we started to do agriculture. So there is a, uh, a massive exponential uh, question in front of us over the next 50 years about how we will feed so many people on the planet. And uh, uh, there are many technologies that will have to be invoked in order to meet that challenge. Um, we'll be talking about a number of them during the, uh, the course of the conference. No, I, I should so, be uh, Just The fundamental objective is really no different from what Mendel described initially, um, although he at that time had no idea what DNA was, or in, in fact uh, the hereditary principle was not defined at that time. But the link between small changes in the genome of a plant can make for big changes in the phenotype of the plants. And uh, functional genomics is really all about that linkage, uh, understanding how uh, minor changes in the genome can have such a fundamental uh, uh, change to, uh, to uh, productivity, uh, quality of the product, um, and uh, uh, resistance to pests and diseases. We felt that if we could begin to answer this question, yes, to move plant breeding a little bit more into the area of design rather than phenomenology. Yeah, that's right. And Just as we begin to do that, um, okay. we will also okay. understand the regulatory mechanisms right. uh, implicit to genome to phenome uh, interactions. Um, ultimately, we'd like to see uh, shorter breeding cycles, if that is possible. Um, and we felt that if it was possible to digitize some of these technologies, we could eventually make them uh, available right around the world. So people would be able to access these things, uh, whether or not they had a massive bank of uh, computer servers in their particular location. So we put this uh, whole presentation together um, really asking the question well, yeah, whether you can, we could we now begin to develop yeah, what you sure. might think of as mathematical descriptions of phenotypes. If we could go to the point of turning this into what would be widely regarded as a big data problem, then there would be new avenues for analyzing uh, the, the results of uh, field trials and uh, breeding experiments. So, you know, in, in systems biology, we've done a very good job of turning the, okay. the genome into essentially mathematically okay. represented concepts. And we can search genomes very readily now. In fact, any, pretty much anybody in the world with access to a computer and uh, the internet can do quite sophisticated searches at like the level of the genome. Well. Obviously, we cannot do that the... uh, with uh, phenotypes yeah. at the moment. And the question is, how far would we have to go in order to make phenotypes uh, as accessible as genotypes? And so this, this whole idea of what would be a reasonable mathematical representation or a numerical representation uh, of different phenotypes and different phenotypic behaviors. Yeah, not getting the main one. If we could do that, then uh, we, we open up avenues that currently we don't, uh, we don't have access to. This is a way of building on the genomics revolution. Uh, genome sequencing has moved so rapidly since the year 2000 when the first plant okay. genome was fully sequenced okay. that Copy um, now pretty much all of our major crop plants are becoming well characterized. And as a result, we can, we can um, work with whole genomes. In fact, we can move into an era of genomic breeding in a lot of our, our, our crops, where we're looking now at specific alleles and specific uh, uh, DNA sequences in, uh, that we will select as part of our germplasm selection program. But in order to move down this path, 
clearly we need to involve technologies that we haven't really spent any time working on previously. And uh, part of the reason we felt um, when we applied for this uh, award that the University of Saskatchewan would have uh, uh, you know, really good arguments to, to bring some of this here was the amount of imaging technology that was already being developed. And then we're the home of the uh, Canadian light source, the synchrotron is here on our campus. Um, we've also got a variety of other uh, infrastructure installations that involve uh, things like uh, um, positron emission tomography, imaging, um, uh, and uh, uh, we've had you know, for, for, for a couple of years before we even started this program, field level energy yeah, yeah, using yeah. AUVs and drones. So there was enough going on that we felt uh, we could actually bring a lot of these imaging technologies together and see if we could uh, use those as a mean, as a platform for the digitizing the new design. One of the things that we got very interested in was uh, ways in which we could understand root systems better. Um, it is uh, I don't, I certainly don't possible to, to grow to, roots in a, 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 a visualizable sure. system yeah, like hydroponics or aeroponics. Um, and in fact, there are quite a few uh, horticultural plants that have grown in hydroponics already. But that is a very different thing from visualizing roots in their natural environment growing through soil. And so one of the things that we set ourselves as a goal was to see if right. there were ways in which we could visualize root systems in a natural environment. And this picture here is just one example. Uh, it does look like these roots are growing in hydroponics, but in fact they are in a soil and sand mix. Um, Why can you see right through it? This is a photo taken using neutron beam, uh, a neutron beam and uh, neutrons are pretty much uh, um, unimpeded by um, the, the, uh, the, the ions and the, and, the, uh, and the elements in soil or sand. But whenever they hit upon high density blocks containing water, then they are impeded. And so what you can see here is the root systems, which are still about 94% water, um, are clearly visible. So there are ways in which we may be able to visualize things that have not been studied in the kind of detail that we would need to do uh, if we we're actually going to do breeding for properties of root architecture, for example. So uh, these are some of the technologies that we've, uh, we've uh, brought together and invoked in this, uh, um, in this enterprise now. Um, some of them are field-based imaging technologies and some of them are more lab-based um, and, uh, and, and you might say immobile forms of imaging, like you can't move a synchrotron around, but there may be ways in which we can produce uh, images from more mobile energy sources, uh, one of those being Betatron lasers, which we have been working with uh, in the Institut National de Recherche Scientifique in Montreal. So just to give uh, a sense as to how we organized ourselves in this uh, uh, consortium, basically we have three pillars and then a couple of foundations on which everything is built. One pillar we call phenometrics, so that's the science of measuring phenotypes. How do we actually get uh, quantitative measurements of phenotypes? Um, and as you can see from that, there's some above ground and below ground. So uh, the plant pedological phenotypes is really looking at the root soil interface, in fact the root soil microorganismal interface uh, as a phenotype itself. In order to do that, we need to develop a wide variety of uh, image acquisition technologies, and uh, that's in pillar two. Uh, this involves um, engineers, physicists, chemists, um, and plant scientists working together in order to figure out ways in which we can get much better uh, images, images that can be uh, turned into quantitative information. And then, 
none of this works unless you have computational informatics working at a, a very high level of both throughput and precision. And you'll hear this morning about work uh, from uh, our computer scientist colleagues about ways in which we're using uh, machine learning um, and uh, artificial intelligence in order to make sense of some of the images that we, uh, we obtain. These are built on a foundation that pervades all of these pillars uh, of crop genomics and bioinformatics, um, because ultimately we are trying to link phenotype to genotype. And we also have a group of uh, social scientists and e economists who are looking at everything from uh, public perception of new technologies in this area, uh, the interest and ability of uh, breeders and other people in the uh, in, in uh, the germplasm development system to actually use these technologies effectively, and ultimately, are they worth anything? Uh, you know, is it is it worth the money spent on this research to actually uh, produce a benefit? So those cost benefit analyses all need to be done. Um, this has enabled us, as I've said, to collaborate with a number of universities and institutes around the country and internationally. And uh, I think we, we have developed now something that is both multidisciplinary and working very well as multidisciplinary collaboration and multinational in the sense that we do link up with most of the major centers of plant phenotyping around the world uh, in order that uh, we don't reinvent things that are already being done, but we complement things where the, the expertise is found. So uh, um, I'm just going to move on to uh, a summary of the program, and then we're going to talk in a bit more detail about some of the specific projects. Um, so right now we've got uh, you know, a large number of funded researchers right here uh, on this campus and funded researchers in, in multiple universities. Um, we broke this down into about 12 projects initially. People self-organized and put together a project proposal which went out for international peer review. Um, we fixed the things that were deficient in those and ultimately got started um, about two years ago in, uh, in, in doing the experimental part of our research. Um, one of the things that we have tried to do is to bring industrial collaboration in as early as possible, and you'll see features of that today because we are actually, we've got quite a few of our industrial um, 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 collaborators that are, that are coming here for this meeting, and uh, we will be talking uh, about some of the uh, commercial applications, the early commercial applications of these technologies. Um, one leading indicator of the fact that we're making progress would be uh, seeing some high impact factor publications coming out of this. This is not the end goal, but it's a, we consider it a leading indicator of success, and we uh, have seen some very good publications over the last two years uh, emerging from this collaboration. And um, when you look at the authorship, you realize how multidisciplinary it really is because now some of the, uh, the author listings on these papers are engineers, plant scientists, and computer scientists, physicists, um, people who really haven't worked together that much in the past but are figuring out ways of uh, blending their uh, expertise and resources to do something uh, that's unique. So. We have uh, obviously used some of the tools that you would imagine um, would be important here. So we'll, we will talk today about image acquisition at the field level, and uh, I think Steve Shirtliff is going to talk uh, in more detail about that. So um, when, when you begin to work at the field level, some of the cameras and, uh, uh, that, that we now use, if you are uh, you know, in the region of uh, of uh, 15 to 20 meters above ground, you can actually get down to pretty much uh, individual plant level. You can uh, home in with the, 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 the photos that are taken and see individual plants. Now, more often, we will be looking at block trials and doing association genetics uh, in, uh, in the earlier work, but there is that opportunity to, to work at a fairly high resolution. 
and I, I won't go into these things other than to show them as illustrations, we can stitch together through thousands of individual photographs an entire um, um, uh, field trial. This is one of Curtis Posniak's Durham uh, wheat trials. And you can home in on any of the individual blocks and look at their performance or look at characteristics that a plant breeder would be looking for, whether it's uh, um, the hue of the plant, the color of the, uh, of the leaves and the, uh, as a surrogate for photosynthesis. But you can also, um, using NDVI and using infrared imaging, you can actually look at the canopy temperature, which is a very good indication of how much water is moving through the system and is often a very good predictor uh, of ultimate yield. So, um, so there's, as it were, an extended amount of information if the right uh, image acquisition tools are available. Um, so uh, I'll just move on a little bit more. This is, uh, again, a, a more detailed look at some of the Durham wheat uh, uh, trials that we've done, uh, um, not last uh, growing season, but the season before. You can clearly see differences in the establishment of these stands. Um, and as you move into uh, um, closer to uh, maturity, you can see very significant differences. You can see lodging, uh, you can see a stay green phenomenon and so on. So a lot of different features that you can pull out from these, uh, these, these images. This works equally well in canola and you can see from the canola trials here, certain blocks are flowering much earlier than others. And, uh, Again, we, we believe that it's, it's going to be possible to do association genetics for key traits that are important to us, whether they be uh, performance traits, uh, um, the earliness um, of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the switch from vegetative growth to, to reproductive growth, um, and uh, properties like uh, lodging resistance and so on. So, so all of these are, are certainly uh, things that we can pick out through uh, overflights using, um, using uh, AUVs and drones. Um, this is just an example as well of uh, what we call a phenome mobile. And uh, um, Scott Noble, uh, as part of this group, has actually built one. This is not uh, the one that we built. Can I just run this little video? Um, because I can't, yeah, if you could just run it. And the reason we, we try and do this at ground level as well is some of the cameras that we will uh, use, and these would be uh, uh, particularly the hyperspectral imaging cameras, can be like $30,000. Uh, those of you who work with uh, AUVs know that they do crash once in a while, and uh, we don't want to destroy the optics of a $30,000 camera. So having some possibility of uh, image acquisition at ground level is also important. And uh, uh, we've uh, now got one of uh, a, a custom-built phenomobile that's ready for work in, in our current growing season. Um, I know these videos aren't going to work, but I, I'm not too worried because Mick is going to talk a little bit about um, the, the uh, uh, what we call algorithmic um, um, a modeling of plant growth. And this is basically uh, a means by which we can actually describe plant growth entirely synthetically, but it provides us with uh, a lot of information that can be fed into programs like uh, training sets for artificial intelligence, and also it's quite predictive in many respects as to uh, developmental biology pro uh, properties. So we'll not worry about those, because you'll see some of those shortly. So we've been running this program, as I said, for about two years. Um, we have certainly made uh, a headway in what we would call leading indicators. There's an awful lot more work to be done, um, but I think the, the satisfaction that everybody uh, that's been involved in this uh, has uh, been able to, 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 to feel is that it truly is <clears throat> a multidisciplinary collaboration, that people have learned the vocabulary and the methodologies of fields that really they didn't work in before. Um, and we are able to, to come up with creative ideas as to how to do these things that working as individual labs we might never have stumbled on. Mm -hmm.